Welcome Duke alumni and friends to this session of the Duke Alumni Forever Learning Institute, an interdisciplinary educational program organized in a set of thematic courses. I am Ann Stevenson, Director of Professional Development on the Lifelong Learning Team in the Office of Alumni Engagement and Development. Thank you for joining our program today, the debate on fossil fuels. This program is part of our theme, Energy Transformation, which will examine the current state of energy, energy cleanup, access to energy, and emerging technologies. Today's program is the second session in the Energy Transformation series that will explore energy alternatives and cleaner options. Joining us today as our host and moderator is Eric Rolfing. Eric is our executive in resident in the Nicholas Institute for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability. Let me tell you a little bit more about Eric. Dr. Rolfing advises efforts for uh, university leadership and faculty to develop and execute a strategy for advancing energy science and technology and to cultivate technological and innovation and entrepreneurship. Dr. Rolfing also mentors Duke Energy students, guiding them there through their learning journey. And he joined Duke after a distinguished career at the US Department of Energy, where he most recently serves as senior technical advisor for the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy which advances high potential, high impact energy technologies that are too early for private sector investment. Welcome to the Forever Learning Institute, Eric. Thanks so much, Anne. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, those of you coming in from Durham know what a wonderful, beautiful day it is in Durham. I appreciate your taking some time out of your beautiful day to join us. You know, our topic today is not so much a debate about fossil fuels, but really talking about how we can wean ourselves away from them. And before we paint fossil fuels as the devil incarnate and terrible, we have to understand, make no mistake, that our economic prosperity that we currently enjoy has been fueled by coal and oil and natural gas. So we're looking at decarbonization as a way to mitigate the impact of climate change. And of course, that's a global global challenge and a global question, but it's a it's a very different one for a country like the United States in a developed economy versus a developing economy. And so what we're going to focus on today is really the U.S. Uh, and, and here we ask ourselves, how can we decarbonize our energy system and really our whole economy uh, without losing the prosperity that we got through fossil fuels? And so one one analogy that I've heard is it's like changing the engines on a plane while you're in flight, um, which generally is not a good idea. We we want to do that without crashing the plane. So we want to change our economy and decarbonize it without uh, losing the prosperity we've become accustomed to. Now, in the developing world, that's a different question. We're asking them to, to undergo economic development without using fossil fuels, with using clean energy sources. So that's a, that's a very different and complex question. So joining me today in our conversation are three Duke scholars who I think really represent the diversity and complexity of the decarbonization challenge. And they'll, they'll share with us their perspective and solutions uh, and, and barriers uh, to the challenges and to the, to the solutions. So they are uh, Jeffrey Glass, who got a global executive MBA degree from Duke. He is currently the professor of electrical and computer engineering at Pratt School of Engineering and director of the Institute for Enterprise Engineering. Uh, Douglas Novacek, who is professor of conservation technology and environment and engineering in the Nicholas School of Environment. And Helen Shu Kim, who is professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering in the Pratt School of Engineering an associate professor of environmental sciences and policy in the Nicholas School of the Environment. Our format today will be a series of three TED style talks, each about 10 minutes or so. We'll hold the last 15 minutes for question and answer. And I strongly encourage everyone, as Anne mentioned, to put questions into the chat, which I'll monitor during the webinar. So let's get started with Jeff Glass to tell us about the work he does at Duke and the perspective on this energy transition. Jeff. It's all yours. Great, thanks very much, Eric. Let me share my screen here. Really appreciate the invitation to come speak to everybody today. Uh, it's a great topic, a very complex topic, and, and one that we uh, many of us have spent a lot of time on uh, over the years. And I'm gonna talk about going from fossil fuel to hydrogen fuel. And uh, in this area, there's good news and bad news. Uh, even the bad news though, has some, some real highlights and, and lights at the end of the tunnel. Um, but make no mistake, as Eric said, 
it's a it's a journey. Uh, so the simple, nice, simple thing is that if we look at the top of this slide here, let me let me pull up my laser pointer here. I can guide guide where I'm speaking. It, it, this is really the simple uh, case of, of of for hydrogen fuel, and that is you can take uh, solar panels or or wind power or any green energy source, and you can put it into water, and you can get hydrogen out. You actually get oxygen out as well. Uh, but that's a great story, right? We put energy into water, and water is everywhere, and we get hydrogen, which is a fuel, just like natural gas. You know, contrast that with our fossil fuels, where we're mining the fossil fuels. We've seen all the pictures on, on the various TV shows of, of the big wells uh, operating, and then the big processing plants. And that provides fossil fuels of various types from coal, oil, natural gas, et cetera. Um, so we start with a really engaging and a story about it. And there's even more good news when we look at it a little more technically. And that is if we look at the fossil fuel example, we take, let's just a simple example of natural gas. We mix that with oxygen and we get heat and water and carbon dioxide. Now, heat is our energy, right? We can use the heat to generate any, any type of energy we want, uh, from automobiles to heating your house. But that carbon dioxide at the end is the problem, right? And it's it's that it's that gas that has been uh, that we need to wean ourselves off of, and that we need to um, develop mitigation strategies for uh, in parallel. Uh, whereas, if we look at hydrogen fuel, this is uh, again the simplistic case is very very exciting and simple. We put hydrogen with water, and we get heat and water. So, excuse me, hydrogen with oxygen, and we get heat and water. So, water is our byproduct. Of course, water is fine for the planet. We need need it. And if we have oxygen everywhere in the air, mixing that with hydrogen under the right conditions, giving us the energy and a byproduct of water is fantastic. So, as Eric mentioned, there's an economic issue of fossil fuels, which has driven our economy for decades. And there's this this phrase now that we hear is the hydrogen economy and that we need to change from the this this fossil fuel economy to the hydrogen economy eventually and that that's the exciting uh, approach or the exciting news and and kind of vision for it but let's not be uh too optimistic about this if we look back at 1984, there was a wonderful book written the solar hydrogen energy economy meaning you take solar energy and you change it you put it into hydrogen and water and you get a hydrogen economy and and that was in 1984. actually there were books written before that i think the first concept was 1920s for the hydrogen economy it wasn't actually coined until the 70s and i just found out actually yesterday it just reviewing some things for this talk that my PhD advisor's advisor coined the term when he was talking, I think it was to BP. So that was kind of an interesting tidbit I wasn't aware of. But the reason I bring 1984 into it is because I got my PhD in 1986. So I was working on fuel cell electrodes at the time. Fuel cell electrodes allow us to take the hydrogen that we form and turn it into electricity. And so at that time, I was really looking forward to a career in fuel cells and a career of finish or working on materials that would make it more efficient to turn hydrogen into electricity with fuel cells. Assuming, of course, there was going to be a hydrogen economy. Well, when I graduated in 19, late 1985, 86, it was clear that this book was very optimistic and there was not going to be a hydrogen economy anytime soon. In fact, uh, it was 20 years before I got back into catalysts and fuel cell materials and the hydrogen economy in my research because, in fact, there was nothing happening at, at scale. Um, there were some small companies and there were some research labs that many research labs that continued the work, but not in a commercial sense. Uh, at least not at, at scale, as I mentioned. So what this led everyone to think about was what is actually happening is hydrogen is the fuel of the future and always will be. So think about that for a minute. That's not a good thing. And we say that about a lot of materials. So hydrogen is not alone on that. The, the material of the future and always will be. So what are the hurdles? Why is it taking, why is it taking so long? Um, well, let's first start with transporting hydrogen. Uh, many people know that historically the Hindenburg airship and the fact that it was a hydrogen filled airship or balloon uh, to say uh, in sort of the vernacular sense. And it caught on fire as it was trying to land 
after a trip across the Atlantic. It, it was a trip that was a commercial trip with 70 passengers in luxury accommodations. And it ran into a storm that it had to avoid, which it did in a, in a, in a uh, fairly easily by changing its course a little bit. But there's speculation that during that avoidance maneuver, it must have done some damage to the hydrogen generation system on board and it started leaking. And because there was a storm nearby, there was a lot of static electricity in the air. It caught on fire as it was trying to land. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, many people jumped and survived that, that disaster, but no airships were ever built for hydrogen again. And so we see uh, hydrogen is an explosive and a combustible material that we have to be very careful with. Perhaps equally as problematic is the cost. And hydrogen, unlike fossil fuels, is scarce in nature. We can't mine hydrogen. We have to make it. Now, that's a double-edged sword, as they say. It's actually quite good in some ways because we can make it in a green way. But it also means that there's some cost to it. So we need to find cost-effective green ways of making hydrogen. And there have been many proposed and many have been uh, continuing to be worked on. Now, I have this last bullet in green because this is my area. I'm a material scientist by training and by my research. And so I'm working on better materials that are needed to convert water to hydrogen. And the better means cheaper, more stable, and more efficient. And all three of those are very important. The stability problem is fundamental, is, is really in the chemistry of the systems that we have to change hydrogen or to change water to hydrogen. So a lot of these things are, are fundamental material science questions that people have been improving upon for the last few decades, but still aren't quite there for commercial use. They're getting very close. I think I looked, uh, the last I looked, there were 350 mega projects for hydrogen creation in green with green energy. Now, compared to a decade ago, I would say they were close to zero. So we have a very strong movement across the globe towards this, this new fuel, but that there's a long way to go, obviously, uh, in, in having it adapted. Now, if we look at sort of the ideal situation, it's not even to have wind power or solar panels uh, make the, the uh, hydrogen forest from water. It's actually to shine sunlight directly onto some device. Let's have a black box here device that we shine sunlight on and it takes the water and creates oxygen and hydrogen. How simple is that? That's actually doable. We can do that today in our lab. We do that. Uh, unfortunately, the scale and the cost are still quite high. I, I want to highlight a couple of, or shout out a couple of uh, other professors working in this area, David Mitzi and Ben Wiley. And Ben in particular, I think, is in the process of spinning out a company in this area. So it is something that's doable and it's going to grow certainly over time. But we need to continue the research to improve that stability of those the electrodes in that black box and to improve uh, the efficiencies so that it does this in a more efficient manner. Now, of course, sunlight is everywhere, so that green energy source is well known and can be harnessed quite readily if we can get the cost down and the efficiencies up. Now, I'm going to just take the last minute or so and just show you some pretty pictures, uh, because at least for material scientists, they're pretty, I, I, I admit. Uh, now, this is what got me into material science, really, is looking at micrographs of various materials. I thought that is just so cool, and that, that launched me into my career. So one of the things that's needed as a, as a catalyst in these devices that transfer or transform water into hydrogen and uh, catalysts come in all different sizes and shapes and materials, but I concentrate on carbon catalysts. And here we see carbon nanotubes where each of these tubes, the diameter is about 100,000 times smaller than the human hair. Uh, so we're making these in, in reactors. And in this case, we put platinum, you can see at the tips of these, uh, these carbon nanotubes, we put platinum particles. And platinum is a fantastic catalyst, and the carbon nanotubes act as our, our pipe to get the electrons uh, and, and holes into and away from the platinum. So that's just one picture. Uh, we can form all kinds of patterns with these catalysts to make them more effective and to make the, the electrolyte or the water, in this case, wrap them in a particular way that or wrap, surround them in a particular way that makes them more efficient. And so just micro pattern them in all different ways. And we do what's called crumpling uh, of these CNTs, uh, which uh, allows us to increase the surface area and open up pores 
And if we look at this crumpled, you can just imagine this is a, a large area of, of carbon nanotubes that's then been stretched and then allowed to relax to make these, these hills and valleys in the crumpled uh, nanotubes. And so each of these lines is, is hundreds of thousands of nanotubes uh, making up each of the lines uh, in that crumpled nanotube. And I'll, la I'll end with just a slide where uh, fortuitous discovery in our labs uh, a few years ago was that you can actually take these carbon nanotubes and and you can combine them with graphene. For for those of you who have watched the tech media, graphene's been a very a hot topic these days. And the carbon nanotube is the backbone. And the graphene, we can grow on this backbone until it's very dense. And each of those graphene flakes or foliates has about a 10x a better, more efficient catalysis uh, um, operation than the carbon nanotube itself. So again, the carbon nanotube is the structure and the graphene is the catalyst. So a fantastic um, combination of hybrid materials. When this was discovered, my PhD student came to me and he, he said, I'm afraid I can't get the material you wanted me to get. I've got this weird thing here, so I'm going to go back and try again. And I said, wait, wait, wait a minute, that's even better than what we were trying to get. Someone's telling us something. And so we've been working on that for the last few years, uh, trying to improve it and, and scale it up. And with that, I'll end. And uh, thank you all very much for joining us and your attention. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, just just a, a follow up comment or two. What one is that you know, if you look at the scenarios for decarbonization uh, produced uh, in the U.S. or internationally, uh, green hydrogen plays an essential role in that. So people are rather counting on hydrogen as uh, as a, as to help with the decarbonization. And one of the more interesting things that's developed fairly recently, and I know Breakthrough Energy Ventures and Eric Toon are very interested in, is geological hydrogen, um, which is essentially found in certain places in the world. It's a reaction between water and iron at temperature underground and hydrogen comes bubbling out. And if those sources can be tapped uh, in, in a reasonable way, there may be a nature-based solution to making hydrogen, despite all the beautiful material science, which I, I, I appreciate. But, um, you know, if nature can do it, nature scales pretty well. So, you know, that's, that's a good thing to do. Yes, if we can find enough of that, that would be a, a fantastic solution. It'll put a few of us material scientists out of business, but that's a <laughs> but happily out of business, right? Yes. Right. Happily. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on to Doug Novacek. Doug, why don't you tell us something about offshore wind? I think that's probably what you're going to tell us about. I am. I am indeed. Thanks, Eric, uh, and thanks um, to all of you for for joining and taking some time. Um, to 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 sit with us and and listen and learn and hopefully ask some ask some good questions. So yeah, I want to tell you all about uh, a, a project that we have um, he, that's led here at Duke. Um, and and big uh, kudos actually to Eric uh, Rolfing, who during the proposal process was a big big help. And so this this idea of having folks with that kind of experience uh, around definitely definitely makes a difference. Um, okay. So I, I this the wildlife and offshore wind project. I'm I'm kind of a um, a uh, an acronym nerd, and so um, Project Wild just kind of jumped out at me. And you never know how well these things are going to go, but I've got I've got lots more of them um, where that came from. But just to just to set the stage a little bit, and I'll come to the the strictly the wind parts of it, but to give you the the sense for the project centered here at Duke with lots of collaborators on the left there you see the all the collaborators in in the project uh from statistics at the University of St Andrews to um uh, passive acoustics at Cornell to birds and bats at at BRI so it's it's a great consortium um it's it's a lot to manage but it's a really great team and and we're we're doing well in the middle there you see the regional wildlife science collaborative for offshore wind that is a group stood up by uh, by the state of New York initially um, to coordinate, uh, collate, lead, um, suggest how how regional the science um, is planned and executed and and brought into into policy um, for offshore wind. But yeah, so over to the right there is our advisory external advisory board, uh, which has state and local governments as well as other some other federal agencies. The project is funded by uh, the Department of Energy and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, 
So so anyway, that's that's the group, and we're we're really trying to be a force multiplier in all this. Uh, and there's a lot of data being collected. We're we're trying to help collate that, especially through Pat's lab, uh, the Marine Geospatial Ecology Lab, and also through through St Andrews. Okay, moving along. Um, offshore wind is uh, is here. Uh, I can't say it's coming anymore because it's it's here. Um, these have been revised slightly, but these are the major offshore wind lease areas from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, this is the, we're working with this group here, um, Vineyard Wind, I'll come to that more. We're also working with um, Equinor and they own Empire uh, Empire Wind One. Uh, and then right off the Carolinas here, we have these two properties in the lease areas in the Carolina Long Bay area. Anyway, there are lots of leases out there. I'm sure some of you have seen in the news, uh, the various juggling around that's going on with the with the energy companies, which is somewhat um, normal. There's a lot of that in the in the energy industry, in my experience anyway. Uh, but there are also some other things that I'll come to when we talk about the hurdles. Okay, moving along. Uh, so this is sort of the conceptual diagram for Project WOW. Uh, and we really kind of started, I mean, it's tempting to start at, at, the, at the top of these things, but there's really no one place that we've started uh, because we have a group of us working together uh, and people are working on all things, a lot of these things at, at once. But the overall idea is to inform the studies that we do. By the first year, we did all desktop um, work on on putting together risk assessment frameworks, some statistical modeling frameworks that we could use, and the data synthesis that that happened in Pat's lab, um, including uh, gap analysis to see where to go, what we needed to do. Um, and then that informed these so-called integrated regional ecosystem studies that we're doing, and I'll come to a bit more than that. And of course, those those results are are meant to fold back into this. And and my vision for it was to have this all set up, but also have the this important parts uh, being the ones that we're using all the time, uh, stand alone and ready to be handed off when when we're done. Um, okay. So a little bit about the the environment, and there's there's been lots of those of you in, live in New York and New Jersey. Uh, probably aware there's quite a lot of um, controversy about some of this, but I wanted to put some of this in context. There's been a lot of talk about putting uh, turbines in the water and what that's going to do to the environment. Um, there are some, and I, I'm going to skip this slide and go to this one um, because it's uh, probably more um, uh, more intuitive maybe, uh, it just occurred to me. This this bottom picture shows a very an extraordinary set of circumstances, which was just the right amount of moisture in the air, plus wind, plus a wind farm. Uh, and you can see the the wakes from the from the turbines. And so there's concern about the wakes from those turbines and actually the pulling the energy out of the wind, which of course is the whole point. Uh, but then also, as I referred to the sticks in the water, obviously have hydrodynamic interactions with the with the tides and currents and things. And so there's a lot of concern about whether that might impact the, the environment. To go back to, with that in mind, to go back to this, this is some physical oceanography from, from that area that you could see boxed there. And, and the bottom line here is uh, that there's so much change and such a huge magnitude of change uh, and, and in different directions um, due to climate change. I mean, the uh, warm water is coming up on the shelf that you see up there in the upper right. Um, and so one of the take-homes from this is that we probably, we have very little confidence that we would even be able to detect a change regionally from, from the wind turbines being in the water, especially around Cape Cod and Nantucket Shoals, which was of great concern for North Atlantic right whales. Okay. So back to the potential threats, uh, for the animals to, to a variety of things, um, Related to offshore wind, there's there's noise things that I'll, I'll uh, certainly spend a little more time on because that's one of the main things I do. Uh, uh, they do they use acoustics for site characterization, looking at sediment type for cable corridors, pile driving operations, all uh, produce some amount of noise, some amount of increased vessel traffic. Uh, this is the North Atlantic right well on the right. You can see some prop scars there. Um, so there's lots of precautions being taken. Um, we we can get into that. It's a you know some place like New York. It's an incremental increase in vessel traffic. Certainly, um, okay. Another wake wake effects that I that I mentioned. And I I know we're going quickly. And and I'm happy to talk to folks later or other times um, if they are there other questions. All right, uh, we're still fighting uh, Cousteau's uh, moniker of the ocean as the silent world because this is not silent. Um, there's lots of noise, both biological and non biological, out there. And this this is the kind of just briefly. I'm not going to go through each one of these. 
This is frequency or pitch uh, of hearing. We hear, just so you know, from about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz or so out here. Um, the marine mammals span this entire uh, this entire thing, and it's when we have overlap with things like seismic air guns, drill rigs and dredging, tankers, frigates, that overlap in the frequency domain with the animals and the, the sounds that they want to use. And this, this is this is volume or amplitude on 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 the on the y-axis. Okay, moving along, um, I am going to just for the sake of time. We know if, we know a, a fair bit about um, interactions between anthropogenic noise sources and and marine mammals. I won't go through it too much. Um, what we don't have is, in this case, the the great concern over North Atlantic right whales. We don't have any data on how they will respond to impulsive noise like pile driving. Um, so that's that's certainly one of our concerns. We have learned a little bit from their cousins. Uh, what we do know about large whales and wind, and this this is this is data directly off the um, New York, New Jersey coast, is that there, there's no evidence that any of these activities associated with associated with offshore wind have any connection to the whale strandings that people are are rightly so concerned about. Um, there's a lot to it. We can talk more about it, um, but I think that there's there there's certainly a lot of work to better understand those. All right, what are we doing in the in the WOW project? These are our two uh, study sites. Again, Vineyard Wind, uh, Lease Area 501. Um, here's Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, for those who aren't familiar with that uh, area. And then over here on the right, we have Long Island and the port in New York. Um, and then this is Empire Wind 1, owned by Equinor. Um, this, I should have said, Vineyard Wind is owned by Avangrid and uh, Copenhagen Investment Partners. Okay, so what are we doing? This is one of the things that Pat's lab put together. Does everybody see that GIF moving along with this, the different uh, uh, color maps? Okay, great. If you look up in the upper left of that, you'll see month, you'll see M1, M2, M all the way up through month 12. So this is a the one-year cycle of right whale density modeling. So this is not sightings, but it's based on thousands and thousands of sightings. And it's these kind of tools that we're using to help um, the, the industry to do what they want to do and what we all want them to do, in my opinion, is to develop renewable energy, but do it in a responsible manner in this case so that the right whales are at minimum densities when they're out there. So using data like this, uh, it's easy to say, okay, you should start in June and go through November. Your chances of having a right whale around are quite low. Um, and, uh, you know, there are other concerns, of course, it's not that necessarily that easy, but you got to have to focus on one at least. Okay. We know what's killing right whales. Um, these are a little bit morbid, but at the same time, it's one of those things that uh, you know people remember. And and this is this is the picture of an, an animal that was on the beach after a, a vessel strike. And if you notice, you can't really see much in the way of. I mean, you don't really know what you're looking at. This is the flipper. This is the lower jaw. This is the upper jaw. This is a piece of baleen sticking out. Um, but inside, this animal had fractures, spinal fractures um, from a vessel strike, uh, and probably. Um, died very soon after that. Um, if you remove neonatal mortalities, 100% of documented right whale deaths have been from ship strikes and entanglement. So it's a pretty staggering um, staggering thing. This is what an entanglement looks like. Uh, the animals get uh, lined through the baleen, which obviously makes it difficult for them to feed. Uh, and they're just carrying a lot of extra drag. So we're trying to, we're working hard to, to uh, protect right whales while we develop um, the wind responsibly. Okay, uh, just a little bit on some of our data collection because it's always fun. Uh, this is a, a boat we used last last year. It's a sailboat, um, not not an IFL boat, but it's owned by a, uh, an outfit in the UK. But we tagged the whales. We tagged fin whales, a lot of fin whales last year. And the idea is that this tag that you see hanging from under there, you see these little suction cups and the antenna coming out the back. I'll show you some more. This thing is like putting an iPhone or a smartphone on the back of a whale. It measures temperature, pressure for, for depth. It has accelerometers in it, so it measures the movement of the animals. There's magnetometers that are giving us heading uh, and recording sound. So what we're looking at is does the, you know, can we see anything in the interaction when the whales hear a sound? Do they do they change behavior? Do they flip over and die? You know, whatever, whatever happens. That didn't happen. Um, so we dropped the tag from the drone with this little lawn dart thing to help it fly, lands on the back of the whale. And then sits on the whale for well, sometimes it sits on there for like five nanoseconds and slides right off, which is frustrating. But uh, but all, they oftentimes will stay on for the program time, which is 24 hours. 
Okay, quickly, photogrammetry. We do that from the drones too, so we can we can measure the animals. These chevron patterns in the gray are actually individually distinctive, so we can tell one animal from another. We also, and this is fun, we collect snot uh, on the snot bot, so we fly it through the through the snot cloud. Uh, this is a passive acoustic system. Two of them, one floating, the other one towed behind the boat. Uh, this is what some of the fin whale calls look like. So this is again frequency or this is time, sorry, and then frequency or pitch on the on the y axis. Lots lots to go through there, but but never never enough time. Okay, I am going to this is this is the last sort of data slide. These are passive acoustic recorders. These fuchsia squares are are ours. And there's a lot of them out there, but this is one of the techniques to listen for animals. Uh, of course, they you only know if they're there if they signal or not. So it's a but it's a big a big area and, and plenty to talk about. What are the hurdles? You've heard a lot about the supply chain hurdles. That's indeed a problem. Why why build these huge offshore wind farms? These are slightly smaller. The ones that are being installed right now off Martha's Vineyard, they are they generate enough electricity that one one rotation of the turbine is enough to power your house all day long. They produce that much power. And that's one of the big attractions to going offshore is because there's no space limitations, basically. Um, so other hurdles, there's certainly uh, regulatory ones. Um, it's a very rigorous regulatory process. These things have taken years to get to the point where they say, okay, go and do your construction and and certainly more to talk about if, if folks are interested in that. All right, I'm going to quit. I'm sorry, I probably went over um, and I'm going to hand it over to him. Thanks, Doug. Uh, yeah, that was great. Um, looking at the various challenges of uh, of the environmental impacts, especially on wildlife with offshore wind. And I think in the interest of time, we will move on to Helen. So Helen, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about materials and sustainability of the energy transition. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is um, the opportunities that we have in terms of um, greening this energy transition away from fossil energy, uh, and actually use the term the green energy materials paradox as a term that I've borrowed from my colleague in civil environmental engineering, Leanne Gilbertson. Uh, basically, what we have here is as we transition from uh, uh, fossil energy-based resources to other more sustainable resources such as solar or wind is that we need to uh, you know, think about the kind of materials that we're making and address the needs for uh, holistic sustainable solutions for this energy transition. Basically design a system that can enable a circular energy material system by design. And so I'm gonna to talk to, uh, about a few different examples of what I mean by this green energy materials paradox uh, in terms of the kinds of uh, mineral resources that will need new uh, uh, ways of accessing, uh, the emergence of new and maybe even old pollution challenges, and then also just some issues related to the kinds of materials that are co-products of the fossil energy industry, and we might need to find alternative sources to these co-products. So in terms of metals and mineral resources, um, it's you know, widely recognized that you know, a lot of these materials that we're making for these uh, new uh, clean energy systems, such as wind uh, or, bad, or um, energy storage devices, will require metals and minerals for which we might not have a um, well-established global supply. So what I have plotted here is from the U.S. Department of Energy Critical Materials Assessment, in which... Um, uh, we're plotting here the uh, various elements from the periodic table and plotting the importance of these elements as they are needed for clean energy technologies and plotting that against the risk towards the global supply. And so anything in red here is deemed in the critical space of elements like dysprosium or cobalt, gallium, graphite. These are uh, elements and minerals that are used for a wide variety of clean energy technologies. So for example, wind turbines are driven by permanent magnets that use hundreds of pounds of rare earth elements like dysprosium and neodymium. Uh, and then also battery storage devices are using um, large quantities of, of elements like cobalt or uh, materials like graphite. And if we were to scale these uh, technologies to replace the, our fossil energy economy, we're gonna need to find new resources or at least establish um, improvements in the resources of these of these minerals 
and maybe even design our materials to better recycle these kind of minerals. So that's, that's an opportunity that is ahead of us. The second example I wanna talk about are, um, you know, new or maybe old pollution challenges that will emerge as we transition to these new technologies. So an example here that I'm, I'm showing here is a graphic showing how various kinds of clean energy devices, including batteries, solar cells, um, various kinds of materials like the blades of windmills are actually coated or contain um, fluorinated uh, hydrocarbons, uh, um, uh, also known as per or polyfluorinated alkyl substances or PFAS. Um, these kind of chemicals, like what I have plotted here, you know, polyvinyl fluoride, um, fluorinated ethylene, propylene compounds, um, these, these, this class of chemicals are uh, known to be uh, extremely persistent in the environment. And because we use them in all kinds of materials, they're actually quite ubiquitous in our groundwater, in our drinking water, in the, in the environment. And uh, the toxicity to ecosystems and humans uh, is, is now emerging in the research. And so in terms of developing these materials for the energy transition, we do need to think about how uh, the scale up of these new technologies will uh, result in the emergence of, of, of pollution challenges. So pollution challenges like these uh, PFAS chemicals. And I imagine that uh, some of these pollution challenges might be you know, chemicals in which we already know a lot about. So for example, um, a new class of photovoltaic materials, the perscovites, are actually materials that contain lead in them. And if we were to use uh, lead, which is a, a neurotoxic metal that we used to use to uh, make leaded gasoline and no longer do that, or make leaded paint and no longer do that. And that's an old, lead is an old problem, but if we were to make these kind of materials that have leaded uh, components to it, that could kind of create a reemergence of this, of this old pollution challenge. And then finally, my third example in terms of an example of this green energy materials paradox is that uh, in our fossil energy economy, we not only make energy out of coal, oil, and, and, and gas um, uh, uh, energy, but we also make other kinds of material co-products. And an example is the co uh, products that we're making from the residuals that of coal combustion. So uh, residuals, which I call coal ash. Um, coal ash, like fly ash, is used for a wide variety of construction-based materials. So for example, fly ash is used to make uh, cement, which is needed for concrete. And so we have a lot of structures. Uh, we make a lot of structures that are actually um, containing coal ash as a replacement to, uh, for, um, for Portland cement. And you know, ironically, this is actually reducing the carbon footprint of concrete production. Uh, concrete. Worldwide concrete production uh, contributes to about 8% of the total CO2 emissions in the globe. And by um, replacing the uh, Portland cement with, with coal ash, we're actually reducing the need to, produ to produce uh, Portland cement, which is really highly emitting in terms of carbon dioxide. Uh, but, you know, we're burning less coal. Uh, and so this graph is showing uh, in the dark blue bars the amount of coal ash that's produced over the last 30 years. And you can see uh, in the last 10 years in particular, with the dark blue bars going down, you can see we're, we're producing less coal ash uh, because we're burning less coal. And that's that's something that is, that is good. Uh, but we're also seeing, which is in the light blue bars, how much of this coal ash we're reusing for these kind of materials like concrete. And uh, what you notice is that these light blue bars are not going down uh, in terms of we still have a demand for this kind of material because we're still constructing new bridges, constructing buildings. And you know, if you were to extrapolate this over in the next 10, uh, 20 years, the coal production, coal ash production will continue to decline. And at some point we're gonna run out of coal ash <laughs> to produce our buildings. And that would mean that we, we might need to find a replacement for this. And so as an example is that, you know, you could use legacy coral coal ash um, that is uh, basically the discarded materials that was produced over many decades of burning coal uh, and stored in these landfills and impoundments and creating their own environmental issues. 
And this might be an opportunity to um, to to uh, use this uh, waste material as a new resource for building our bridges and, and highways and such. You know, uh, in, in our work, we've estimated that there's about 2 billion tons of discarded coal ash all around the country. And uh, this might be a material resource uh, opportunity uh, as we transition to the green energy economy. So just to sort of summarize, um, you know, I talked about examples of uh, opportunities in which we can create sustainable solutions as we transition to the green, to uh, renewable energy resources, uh, and uh, give you some examples related to our mineral resources that we will need, the emergence of new pollution challenges, and then also thinking about the kinds of coal products that we're going to co products that we're going to have to find how to make them now that we're decreasing our uh, fossil energy footprints. Thank you. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, we're going to enter the question and answer phase now. Um, there have been a lot of good questions in the chat, and I have a few questions and comments uh, myself. I think the three speakers that presented this afternoon really do represent the complexity um, of the challenge we face with this energy transition. Um, so let's start uh, with Jeff and, and some hydrogen questions. One of, the, one of the interesting questions that came up on the chat, which is a, is a good one, are looking at trade-offs and the use cases for hydrogen, right? I mean, hydrogen can be used in a lot of different ways. You know, it can be put into natural gas to clean up natural gas for combustion purposes. We use as its own fuel for a chemical heat source to replace fossil fuels in industrial processes. Um, it can be used uh, for transportation and fuel cell vehicles, um, and it can be used in long duration energy storage. And in fact, in cases of things like offshore wind, where you generate a lot of electricity and you want to store it for periods when the wind might not be blowing so well, you might want to generate hydrogen, store it, and then use it later. Do either any of you have some comments about your thoughts on the best use cases for hydrogen? You know, in, in some ways, it, it's, it can be argued that it's marginal benefit for the mixing in the, in the existing infrastructure. The benefit is it's also marginal cost compared to all of the um, uh, more significant uh, applications that we can think of. Um, but I think the better um, maybe approach is to think about how we enhance the applications that truly drive the uh, climate and the environmental issues. And one, uh, there was a great, well, not too many years, maybe two or three years ago, where it talked about the, the problem is chicken and egg, as they say. And that means that we have some hydrogen sources that have been proven in a prototype sense to work for certain applications, but they're not at scale. Well, the applications already have a solution in fossil fuels, so they can't switch over until they know the risk of scaling is reasonably low. So you've got this chicken and egg. Do we bring a, a much more hydrogen online without the application paying for it? And that's, I think, where we're stuck. So it, it kind of is a little bit of a of a leapfrog kind of process where we need probably, you know, policies and uh, the infrastructure from an investment perspective in the in the venture world has to believe in the production uh, equation such that the applications start to. Uh, drive that production, but it's it's going to take some time to you know, each to grow at the same rate. So it has to be in parallel. We can't just say put all the production in place and then have the applications use it, or all the applications switch over before there's enough production for their you know the future, the, the five year future. So I still think though that that's the direction we need to go, as opposed to sort of these marginal um, processes that will help a little bit, but really just. To delay the problem, I guess. And that, that's just personal opinion. Yeah. You know, there are lots of good references being put in the chat. I'm very impressed with the uh, Duke alumni here. They're putting in lots of DOE reports and other reports on uh, use cases and, and uh, you know, abatement curves for hydrogen and whatnot. So kudos to them. Um, Doug, I know you answered this question in the chat, but there were some questions about the kind of the NIMBYism for offshore wind and, and, is that regulatory environment, is that public perception environment changing? Uh, and specifically, maybe you could talk about, you know, the potential for offshore North Carolina with respect to that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. 
Thanks, Eric. Uh, yeah, the nimbyism is is really it's an interesting in, in this case in that. Um, uh, well, I first I have to give credit to Steve Rohde, who who uh, is is a, a Duke faculty member in the in Nichols Institute in the law school, who n after NIMBY is banana, which is build at another site or something like that, another location, and then the last one is nope, which is not on planet Earth. So um, we're 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 solidly in the in the in the NIMBY side of it for for offshore wind. I think purely for aesthetic reasons, um, and I, I personally find wind turbines, you know. Uh, kind of pleasant to actually stare at. But anyway, um, about nine months ago or about a year ago, some groups started forming along the New Jersey and New York coasts that were claiming that whales, the whale increase in whale mortality in, right, in humpback whales in particular, which has occurred over the last uh, almost 10 years, eight years now, um, was because of offshore wind activities. And those groups, uh, there's a really interesting study that um, put together by a group at Brown University, linking basically all of those groups back to uh, the Koch brothers, to the American Petroleum Institute, to a variety of sources um, that were that are clearly trying to to um, torpedo the industry. Uh, so at the at, you know we can you know, the rest of the discussion is is an interesting one to have. But I'll stop there with that and just say that I think that it's. Um, uh, the rhetoric, the rhetoric has changed a little bit, and there's been enough. I think both so DOE, NOAA, um, uh, BOEM all had very prominent um, websites stating that there's no link between offshore wind and dead whales, and so I think that that's sort of started to calm down a bit. Um, there was another part to your question, though, Eric. Uh, well, uh, I think that there. It's oh, go ahead. It was the you know regulatory side of things. Yeah, the regulatory side of things is is well ensconced and and in some would argue uh, overly bureaucratic, but it involves both. It involves the National Environmental Policy Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and the um, Endangered Species Act, which all act in in slightly different ways. In in don't forget way. the Jones Act. Then the Jones Act. Oh my God, <laughs> I don't know who's familiar with the Jones Act, but um, just to give you so this is about uh, foreign vessels calling at U.S. ports, and it's a I mean, it's a hundred year old protectionist uh, law, but the upshot of it for Vineyard Wind, get this, to do their installation over the summer, the installation vessel, first of all, couldn't couldn't use jack ups, which they like to do to put down on the bottom of the, on the seabed to stabilize themselves. It had to use dynamic positioning because as soon as it touched the seabed, then it was considered to have made land in the US. Um, to, to resupply, that vessel had to go to Halifax, Nova Scotia because it couldn't come into U.S. port, pick up supplies and go back and work in U.S. waters again and go into a different port. So anyway, there, there, there are definitely hurdles. I think they're, they're being ironed out. And somebody put in the chat, certainly the interest rates and, and the changes in, uh, in cost, the inflation itself is what really drove a lot of these uh, changes. And, and the states of uh, New York has definitely come back and said, okay, we'll, we'll rebid these, these power purchase agreements, as they're called, um, because of the change in in cost, and they'll rebid them to the to the company. So they've gathered some more steam on that on that news. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. So Helen, there's a, a couple of questions in the chat that I'll that I'll pose to you. And one is, um, you know, is the U.S. well positioned with respect to critical materials and minerals uh, to make the green energy transition? And then. Related to that is, you know, who, who evaluates uh, the various uh, elements and materials and constructs policy um, to drive green energy transition forward? Um, well, in terms of the position of the U.S. in terms of accessing mineral resources, I think um, there's a there's a lot of awareness that we have work to do. So I I wouldn't say that it's a problem solved, but there is a lot of work behind establishing new resources using both traditional mining methods, uh, the development of rare earth mines, for example, out west, uh, lithium mines around the country, as well as uh, developing resources from non-conventional resources. So I mentioned coal ash as one, but other kinds of mine waste, so tapping into um, coal mine waste, for example, which tends to be enriched in rare earth elements as well. So there's there's a decent amount of work on that. Um, I would say in terms of the extent of the commercialization, I think 
Well, there's a lot of examples of pilot projects, early commercial stage, but not more than that is my, is my understanding. So we still have, that's where I, that's why I mentioned we still have work to do. Um, and then the second question relates to who decides. Uh, could you, do you mind repeating what? Yeah, it's basically, I mean, you referenced the DOE report on critical ener critical minerals and materials, but, you know, is, is, is that continuing, uh, you know, is there someone in the federal government that's laying out a policy and a plan, um, you know, uh, to, to, ensure that the U.S. is in a good position to make this transition. Yeah, um, so yeah, DOE uh, uh, examines the issue of mineral needs, the supply uh, every every couple of years. Uh, so also the U.S. Geological Survey also um, examines that from the perspective of our natural uh, resources for mining. Uh, and that those kind of reports actually help a lot in terms of guiding investments of um, new technologies and materials, basic research uh, and that would be applied for clean energy technologies and, and understanding how those resources, in terms of the decisions that are made in developing these materials, whether we have the resources available to you know, scale up the, the, the materials that we use. So there, there is, uh, that's kind of the extent of you know, how we're keeping tabs on, on that. I mean, I think I think that's one of the challenges of making this transition is making it in both an environmentally sound way and thinking about the full life cycle of the materials that we use. How do we recycle, you know, batteries? How do we reuse batteries? You know, what are, what are the materials uh, we're using and what their impact could be? And also, you know, uh, you know, an equitable and just transition, right? So that we don't repeat the problems of the past in terms of uh, putting an unfair burden on certain parts of our population uh, to, to, to shoulder the worst of the environmental impacts. So there's an environmental justice aspect. So it's a it's overall a challenging transition for sure. I, I know we're getting kind of close to the time and Anne's going to jump in here and interrupt us, but I wanted to ask one question of all of you, which is uh, one of the most important things I've seen since coming to Duke is the amazing energy and power of students. And so I wanted to get your take on what your students think about this transition we're trying to undergo, which, you know, we're kind of handing off to them, like, you know, here's this problem. Fix it for us, will you please? So what, what do your students think? Who can unmute the fastest? Look like me. Oh no, Helen was still. Go ahead, Helen, if you wanted to. Well, I mean, I guess it's, um, it, our students are enthusiastic. They're optimistic. They work hard. And so you present like a salient problem in front of them and they'll they're, they'll jump off, they'll jump after it. So um, especially like in a way, I, so I've been teaching the same class for way too many years in a row, more than 15 years in a row. and. When I insert examples that are related to this topic, I think that's when I suddenly get people to, the students to actually pay attention. So I think, you know, this is definitely something that um, it's it's great to be around students who are, who are, who are excited about this. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I, I think Helen said it really well. The, the uh, optimism, enthusiasm, and I'll even say idealism of the students is just refreshing. Um, from an engineering perspective, it's very interesting. There is that quote, uh, you know, confidence is the feeling I get before I fully understand the problem. And... <laughs> Our students at, at their you know early stage of their career, uh, but it makes it no less exciting to work with them and see them. But they do they they want to take on the problems. They're making progress when they do. Um, but there's a reality that does hit them that that uh, as they learn more and more about the situation. Yeah, I, I, and the only thing I would add to that that I can think of is is just the um, <clears throat> the their uh, unabashed. A, you know, approach to try and figuring out these figuring out problems and 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 just I mean they're just smart, right? I mean, the, so, you know, I have a variety of students from engineer engineering students to environment students to pre med and whatever, and you know they 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 ask me questions. I teach an offshore offshore renewables class now, and they ask me questions that I've never had before in my whole career. So I was like, holy moly! So I almost handed over the podium. Uh, at that point, so they're already they're already pretty smart. Hopefully, we're making them a little smarter. Uh, I will say, interestingly, real quick, that um, the marine megafauna class, which is a, a freshman class, um, they they've had a discussion, and I'm going to go give a talk. They had a discussion where 
the students thought that offshore wind was bad because they 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 were convinced that it was killing whales. And so, you know, the the, the social media influence, the constant news cycle is definitely hits our students. And so I think, you know, keeping them grounded in as much as digging for the actual uh, um, facts is important too. Okay, I think we want to segue back to Anne, and I want to thank all of our speakers, Jeff, Helen, and Doug, for a great presentation today. And uh, Anne, uh, take it back to you. Okay, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Jeff, Helen, Doug, and Eric for a great session, and to our audience for joining us.